Hello and welcome to Great Lives. My guest this week is Mark Gatiss, an actor and writer who came to fame as one quarter of the frighteningly grotesque League of Gentlemen. Success at the Edinburgh Festival was followed up by a Radio 4 series, then the delights of Royston Vesey were unleashed on an at first surprised television audience. They soon got the hang of it. He has the rare distinction of both writing for and appearing in the new Doctor Who as a power-crazed mutating villain, and his Lucifer Box series of crime books is a more recent string to his bow. Mark, whom have you chosen as your great life and why? Uh, I've chosen Peter Cushing, who is an actor I always admired. I think at, at the most basic level, just an actor I always look forward to seeing, which I think is is a wonderful thing for any actor. <laughs> and in fact, if you have the reverse, it's 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 not good for your career. But I think from a very early age, and not just because of his appearance in in horror films, which were my sort of staple diet from uh, from childhood, uh, I I just knew he was very very good. Poor man. And I am powerless. Powerless. Perhaps I can help. Who are you? You sent for me. Dr. Van Helsing. Oh, thank God you've come. Thank God. It's a sort of common thing to say that he never gave a bad performance, but actually I think that's, that's, that's true and a rare achievement. He, he was an amazingly uh, sincere actor, a very kind personality who nevertheless sort of made his name playing uh, monsters. He's forever associated with the roles of Count Dracula's nemesis, Abraham van Helsing, and that of Victor Frankenstein. It was these that made him a star, but his association with the horror genre has obscured a long career of radio, television, stage and screen work, with, with colleagues stretching from Laurel and Hardy to Harrison Ford and Laurence Olivier and Vivian Lee somewhere in between. So helping us to chart a course through Cushing's life and career is the author of The Peter Cushing Companion, David Miller. David, it's, it's the Hammer horror films that stand out as Cushing's natural habitat, so most people would be a bit surprised to learn about his, his early days. Tell us a bit about that. He started off as a rep actor, small repertory theatres all around the country in the late 30s. He then went on a, a one-way ticket to Hollywood. When the war started, his patriotic duty, he felt, was to come home, uh, which he did in, in a very uh, circuitous route, and then uh, worked for Ensa. What was so, his childhood background? Any so, sign that he had a vivid imagination? Or oh, anything? certainly a vivid imagination, yes. He, he was always putting on little puppet shows and the idea of performing was always there. I think he, he said that it was one of the few things he could do. Is it true he used to play at throwing himself down the railway embankment behind his garden? He would enact various sort of, uh, certainly cowboys and Indians, he would, uh, he mm. would put on uh, performances and he did like dressing up. I mean, there was always a bit of, uh, it was always daring do, it was always that very... Yes, yes, it was always that, always that very special kind of, of sort of childhood dressing up and playing and I think it, it carried on I would say, throughout his entire career. Do you, you, know, th do you think, Mark, that one can look back on the childhood of somebody who eventually developed into, blossomed into something and, and actually see the early seeds? I mean, could, could we have known about your career from oh, looking at yes. it? <laughs> We're going to be a monster. <laughs> <laughs> what a power-crazed, mutating monster. <laughs> Very much, yes. Yeah. Well, I do think so, yes. But I've been lucky enough to actually make my sort of childhood obsessions into a career, so hmm. there's, a, there's a probably a, a straighter path through. But I think that's very true. My, my mother always used to say I was morbid. <laughs> and <laughs> She'd come and open the curtains in the summer holidays because I was watching ho horror films rather than playing outside. It's all there. Mm. But I think it's very true. It's oddly with, with Peter Cushing... Um, his his favourite films were Douglas Fairbanks movies, and he loved Swashbucklers. Actually, considering the sort of films he ended up mostly doing, but he's a very athletic actor, and there are moments in in some of the early Hammers, particularly, which are absolutely up there. You know, he there's real racing real. down tables, pulling down curtains to let the daylight in on Dracula yeah. and stuff like mm. that. Which is, I think, he you can really sense then he's having the time of his life. You know? There are some lovely stories from those early days in. In Hollywood, I read somewhere that when he was working with Carol Lombard, he asked the director, am I allowed to touch her? Yes. <laughs> well, you, you also get this wonderful s sensation of a, a very diffident English man mm. turning up at Hollywood in a kind of... into Hollywood. Yes, yes in exactly. An, in an extraordinarily very, yeah. fertile time and, mm. and not quite knowing what to do with himself. And what was this business about him ending up in, in, in prison in Canada? 
Oh, well, he very nearly ended up in prison. He was working on uh, sort of odd jobs at the time in Canada, and he he did uh, various things. I think he was a cinema usher at one point, and and uh, uh, parked cars and all sorts mm. of things. But he, just he, he, amazing he to have the yes, young Peter Cushing parking your car. It's very <laughs> very similar, very similar to Boris Karloff actually, a very similar sort of career path. But he ended up making props for a film called Forty Ninth Parallel, where he had to make little flags of the the boats or something that would be pushed around a map. Yeah. So he was making little Nazi swastikas yeah. and laying them all out in his in his digs where he was staying. And uh, the landlady came in to, to clear up or something, found all, this, found all this Nazi paraphernalia and called the police. <laughs> I just love to think of the youthful <laughs> Peter Cushing in a bedsit in Montreal, yeah. sewing little <laughs> tiny swastikas. Little swastikas which, yeah. Yeah. When he came back... David, he he met the the love of his life, and often great men and women sort of marry along the way. But that wasn't the case. He didn't marry along the the way. She kind of defined the rest yes, of his the, life. The, the the Cushing story is nothing without Helen, whom he met at the stage door of Drury Lane Theatre when they were on a bus, or they were waiting for a bus for uh, to take them off to their ENSA engagement. And they fell in love over the course of playing opposite each other in private lives, where they had to throw things at each other and, uh, you know, argue every night. So they said, well, we've been doing it this long, we might as well do it for real, you know. (laughs) But then suddenly there is someone who will, I suppose in a sense, mother him, but Mm. but definitely sort of give more structure to his life. And she was the one who encouraged him to to write to to television, wasn't she? Do you sense, Mark, that uh, he was one of those creative geniuses who knew from an early age that he had talent and knew that he was going to be a great actor is is there oh no i don't think so at all I, I get the very strong feeling that he needed someone like helen to 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 absolutely uh conduct his, his talent as a sort of lightning rod i think he i think he was he never ever comes across as an arrogant man in fact completely the opposite he's he's, he's so self-effacing in some interviews he almost disappears mm. but i'm sure that at the, the core of it he would not have got as far as he did anyway without some level of self-belief but i think very much he would have just muddled through uh without someone to sort of say right if you do this we might get here i think he he himself has admitted that he wasn't a very good actor to start off with mm. he learned his craft and he, he always sort of regarded it as a as a trade it was mm. it was something that you learned like a, like a carpenter or a mm-hmm. you know a, a sculptor or something like that it was something that you you worked at for a very long time and he did he did 3 years 4 years in rep where he was playing a part every week so that you know enabled him to try out just about everything and i'm sure there were sort of you know dotty little old men that he played in rep that eventually ended up in in Hammer films, you know. I remember that wonderful form. story about he, he thought his name wasn't helping him, so he changed it briefly to Peter Ling, <laughs> hope, hoping that, uh, that, that the sort of uh, trade papers would attach Da to it and make him the darling. And then he got a letter back saying they didn't think there was much of an opening for Chinese actors. <laughs> <laughs> that was the end of that. <laughs> How did he get his, his first jobs? He wrote off for a lot of jobs. That was that was really when he came to work for the BBC. Mm. There was a period, even though you know he worked in the Olivia Company, forty nine, nineteen fifty. There was a period where work just stopped. Mm. You know, the work mm. just sort of dried up. And Helen said, "Right, there's this new medium everybody's talking about, television. You'll you'll you know you'll be good at that. You know, you've got a good face. You remember your words. You don't bump into the furniture." Considering there was a snobbery about television probably in, until the 1980s yeah. Yeah. among certain actors, for an actor to th- who, who already had quite a stage presence and the Olivier connection, mm. etc., to volunteer for this new medium, I think it's, it's a wonderful thing, example of, of them sort of leaping ahead. Shows yes. enormous foresight as yes, well. It Shows a tremendous but actually foresight. a kind of accidental foresight, yes. because yes. they were, he was quite desperate. Because it was work. It but was it work. was just work. But actually what it, what it led to was, was him becoming one of the very first television stars, right? Cushing played Mr Darcy in an mm. early TV adaptation of Pride and Prejudice. What yeah. was television like in those days? Not that you were there. But, I uh, was. No, he was. I, <laughs> I was a mutating villain. Um, <laughs> the best of it is absolutely up there, mm. and some of it is a lot better than anything we've got now, particularly if you think about something like Quatermass and the Pit, which is one of my favourites, an incredible, incredibly ambitious production done live, 
of six weeks. You know, just extraordinary uh, intensity uh, and mood and atmosphere yeah. and scale. To it, it's amazing, amazing this business of its being live. Yeah. I mean, he played Winston Smith in the BBC's yes, adaptation yes. of George Orwell's 1984. Here's a clip. As you will see, this is a mask. It fits over the head, leaving no exit. When the plastic door is raised up, the rats will shoot out like bullets. It was a common punishment in Imperial China. The rats were caught in the sewers a week ago. Now they're starving. No, do it to Julia. Do it to Julia. Not me. Julia. I don't care what you do to her. It's Julia. Julia, not me. Not me. You're listening to Great Lives, where my guest this week, Mark Gatiss, has chosen the Hammer Horror star Peter Cushing. Our expert witness is his biographer, David Miller. David, after that big success with 1984, where did Cushing's career go? Um, quite remarkably, he was one of the first actors to be on a full-time commission from the BBC. He was contracted as a BBC player. The BBC got very slightly frightened that commercial television was just about to start and that all their actors would run away because commercial television would pay them lots of money. So they wanted a few who they had under contract and that, that were theirs. Mm. I think they, they had to fight very hard to get their six plays out of Peter Cushing, which was what the contract was, because he kept, he kept nipping off to make another film. I mean, he, he basically started making Hammer films while he was still under contract to the BBC. I think the irony is, though, that, and it probably wouldn't happen today, is that despite the incredible classiness of 1984 and all its literary credentials and the people like Andre Morel and Donald Pleasance who are also in, in the cast and, and the fact that Cushing was an extraordinary performance and it, there were questions in the house and everything, mm. essentially the papers regarded it as a horror play and then so the next logical step for a film company was not look at that amazing lead, he could play... X. It was Room 101. It was, yes. it, it was yeah. therefore a horror, a horror story. A horror project. And that's not to be pejorative about Hammer, obviously, yeah. but, but actually it's an interesting step. But now I think a star-making performance like that might have led to, you know, uh, some big war movie or a romantic lead, as you say. Uh, and actually the logical step back then w was for a, a nascent um, company like Hammer to, uh, to, to approach him as, the, oh, he does horror things, we'll, we'll have him, people will go and see him in that, which is actually true, isn't yeah. it? I'm interested that neither of you have so, so far mentioned his face, his extraordinary <laughs> face, which uh, would work a little bit on stage, but people are very small on stage and works beautifully in film mm -hmm. and television. How, how important do you think that was to, to his career? It's hard to say, isn't it? Because you, I mean, one never saw him on stage, so, mm. uh, and he's actually, he comes across on the screen as smaller than he was. He, he mm. seemed, maybe because he was always with Christopher Lee, <laughs> who was six foot, uh, six foot five, uh, but it's actually, his face has this extraordinary sculptural yes. quality. Yes, scooped. Uh, yeah, and, and I mean, as he got older and slightly more gaunt, it becomes genuinely sort of, you know, Mount Rushmore yeah. uh, like, doesn't it? But, but actually, Extraordinary intense eyes, beautiful bone structure. You, you get a very strong sense right at the heart of him was was a, was a kindness. Yes, and even though he often played yes. fanatics, it made it creepier. Or, yes, I guess yeah. yeah. you're right. Yeah, yeah. I, I, there's, a, there's a fanatical edge to, to some of the performances, particularly his Frankenstein. His, his dedication runs away with him, and then Van Helsing, who's on the side of the angels, is sort of equally. Fanatical. Mm. There's there's a there's a there's a sort of quiet despair somewhere mm. in the middle of him, humour and an edge which which, uh, which which kind of the face sells. I think here he is in the Revenge of Frankenstein. It should have been perfect. I made it to be perfect. If the brain hadn't been damaged, my work would have been hailed as the greatest scientific achievement of all time. Frankenstein would have been accepted as a genius of science. Instead, he was sent to the guillotine. I swore I would have my revenge. They will never be rid of me. This is something I am proud of.
Mark, was this your introduction to Peter Cushing? No, my f the, my introduction was uh, was The Brides of Dracula, mm. which was the first horror film I saw when I was four and a half. My parents were very kind, allowed me to watch absolutely anything, <laughs> uh, in which he plays uh, Van Helsing. Uh, it's a wonderful, visceral treat of a film. Uh, oddly, not not starring Christopher Lee. It's a, it's a slight cheat, as. Uh, He'd been staked, uh, destroyed at the, at the end of the previous one, and they got a very interesting actor called David Peel to play this rather fey vampire. It's kind of Cushing's film as a result, mm. because it's the Van Helsing spin-off, as it were, but it's a wonderful film. Uh, and I think, in that way, I just became immediately aware of, of things. You, you join the dots, I think, as a child, very quickly. Whatever you, you know you're interested in, you immediately seek out other things. So I was aware of other films being on in the sort of Friday night horror slot as they always were but then also big glossy movie books with these in intensely attractive intriguing stills from later films i knew nothing about and so you sort of you immediately chart a course i think and then you start to to develop your favorites and he was always mine how influential for you was that whole genre of slightly but not completely ironic british horror in, for instance, shaping your own grotesques for Royston Vase. It's absolutely at the heart of it. I think for us in the League of Gentlemen, a, a kind of a, a, a common heritage mm. uh, and one of the initial things we bonded over was was just sort of the sort of shared memory of, of appointment with fear, it used to be called in my region, <laughs> and a Friday night treat. Just, just because I increasingly retreat into my childhood, I've started watching... DVDs of, of old horror films on a Friday night in the same slot, and it still works. It does mm. the same thing. I don't know what it is. It's a sort of magical quality. But definitely, I think the kind of, pardon the pun, but the full-bloodedness mm. of, of particularly the Hammer approach, the, 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 the grandiosity of the scores, and even though they were doing them uh, for not an enormous amount of money, that there's a sort of, there's a wonderful charge to them. Yes. There's a vibrancy, there's a sincerity as well. And I, I think, I actually think that the, the, the sort of, the tongue-in-cheek quality is more what people have imposed upon it. Uh, certainly in the later years with Hammer, they, they became rather more, there's a slightly desperate edge to them trying to catch up with black exploitation or kung fu and things like that. But just as there was with James Bond, actually, oddly enough at the time, there's a sense of that they weren't leading the pack anymore. But I think the earlier ones... They hit upon something so clever, which was to take the, 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 the black and white universals, which, of course, then weren't that old. It was only 25 years before. But suddenly, in a world where Eastman colour was suddenly going to hit the screen, they could, they could really go for it. Because of television, he'd learned how to use very, very subtle inclinations of his eyes and you know, maybe just widening yes. his eyes fractionally made all the difference. There, there are close-ups in Curse of Frankenstein where he does nothing more than sort of turn his head very fractionally. Um, he had a wonderful trick of, of turning out of camera and then suddenly shooting back in. He, he does it, you know, almost in every film you'll find this point where he does it. It's a very theatrical trick, but he'd learned it and he used it. And he Terence, works, Terence yeah. Fisher knew that it, you know, it would work and it would underline you know, a particular thing. It's also wonderful, you just listen to that clip there, the, the diction is amazing. Yeah. And there's, a, there's a, a enjoyment of words like guillotine, guillotine. and <laughs> Frankenstein, and uh, they'll never be rid of me. It's very, very precise. And he always played it straight. I, I think I think that's that's key. He, he didn't camp it up, as you say. Yeah. We, we've we've tended to project that onto it, but, yeah. but he wasn't camping it up. I mean, there are some... He was in some pretty wretched films... <laughs> To, to be frank, uh, not not very many. I mean, but you know, he, there was a time after his wife died when he, he he said he was just marking time, and he just did a lot of stuff he probably shouldn't have done. But he never ever lets the film down. He's mm. not the one. Mm. And there are some terrible Hammer films like Legend of the Seven Golden Vampires, which is beyond <laughs> gim crack, isn't it? And you know, he's still doing it. He's still oh, he's still there. There, yeah, but he had cardboard yeah. castles, gall gallons of fake blood, every Victorian Gothic cliche. In the book, it must have been hard to keep a straight face at times. I don't know because I think I'm I'm always I'm a tremendous admirer of actors who sign on the dotted line. Mm. I can't bear it if people sign up for something and then moan for yes. the rest of the yeah. shoot or the rest of their career. And I think Pete's Cushing is the perfect example of someone who committed completely to whatever he had agreed to do, as you say, because it was a because it was his profession and he did it professionally. The vampire, by its kiss, the taking of blood from its victim. Makes of that victim another vampire. 
so the cult grows, infinitely slowly, but it grows. Well, another thing which is what we've not talked about, he's a very funny actor. Yes. And actually, despite the, the absolute sincerity of the of the horror performances, you know, he was a semi regular in Markham and Wise, if you remember with his he was never paid. But he was he was always after uh, his his ten pound sure. fee. It was <laughs> such a funny thing. And and uh I think again, oddly he, he he hit the British film industry at just the right time for him, but actually slightly further on he might have he might have been asked to do some slightly more interesting mm. other films um, some sort of sort of seedier roles or you know or pinter or something and 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 it, 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 that sounds pejorative about what he actually did, which was a wonderful Great thing. Pinter. But you mm. know who knows mm. his it's wife stomach. died fairly young didn't didn't she was it nineteen seventy did his career so. did his career survive that it did because he threw himself into work he was making i think four films a year at that point, you know, and a, a lot of them for Hammer because he found the people reassuring, you know, it was reassuring to have the old crowd around him, you know, and they um, they put up with some of his um, frailties, you know, and, and he, you know, he wasn't, he wasn't beyond occasionally breaking down in tears on set. There's an interesting thing where you can tell he's grieving so intensely. It's, mm. it's, it's actually quite weird to watch some of those films because you feel like you're intruding. In Tales from the Crypt, the character, Arthur Grimsdyke, his wife has died. She's called something else. In fact, the headstone had obviously already been made that, that you mm. see. And he obviously put a line in saying, she was Christian Mary, but I called her Helen. And then he had, her, he had his wife's photograph put into a frame and it's in the ghoul as well, mm. isn't it? And he does feel very intrusive. He says in his autobiography that um, his wife when she was dying, um, asked him, left him a note, uh, begging him not to commit suicide. Mm. It's extraordinary. Mm. She must have known. Well, how... st- he tells a story, doesn't he, about uh, on the day it happened. He says uh, he just went mad, and he tried to induce a heart attack by running up and down stairs. <laughs> but I, I, I love that. I think that's kind of quintessentially Peter Cushing, because he didn't slash his wrists or take any pills. No, just, he... <laughs> it was too messy. It would have, <laughs> yes, it would have meant somebody else having to clear it up. Yes, out. I'm sure that was at the heart of it, yeah. He, he, he did confess that there were a few flings that he had when he was younger while still married to Helen. Again, it's, it's part of that childishness or boyishness that, you know, if, if he was thrown into a romantic entanglement, uh, yes, he, he, he did have a few dalliances. He was always mortified about them. And, um, yes. You know, he's, he's, he's terribly... Um, but I feel it does make him, more, it makes him more human because there's a, a sort of... Edifice has grown up around the idea of, of his of his sainthood mm. and also of of Helen being the love of his life. She was the love of his she life, was. but actually, <laughs> just these tiny chinks seem to let a little daylight in. And when when he'd been unfaithful to Helen, apparently he would telephone her and confess. And in one case, he phoned her and said, "I've done something terrible. I'll be home soon. Put the kettle <laughs> on." <Yeah. laughs> you couldn't. <laughs> he couldn't. He couldn't make it up. He played science fiction as, as well as horror, notably Doctor Who for the big screen and the villain's villain, Grand Moff Tarkin, Darth Vader's boss in the original Star Wars. You, you don't get more villainous than that, do you? Darth Vader's boss, no, that, that, was, um, that was tremendous. I, I think one of the great strengths of, of Peter is his ability to act frightened. Yes. And sometimes it was, you know, it was howling, you know, mad fear, you know, desperate sort of terror... And sometimes it was just this terrible sort of something dreadful was, was mm. hanging over him. And he does that in Star Wars, actually. It's terribly clever that Darth Vader, although he is essentially a, supposed to be a minion, there's something that Cushing does that makes out that, no, he's, he's in charge. Well, what's fascinating about that film is, that, of course, it, it stands out as a, as a late flowering in his, in his career. But, of course, to him, still making hammers up until yeah. the, the mid 70s and still making a lot of british films it was probably about a week and a half yeah. at just another Elstree. picture just a just a kid's picture and it became you know. this huge thing but but uh, exactly as we've been saying before his sincerity sells that so that now that film of them all particularly because of guinness as well yeah it's so classy it's yes. just it's got it's like george lucas has just chosen completely by accident the two <laughs> best british actors to really sell it Hasn't it? I think there was a review that said that uh, between them, Guinness and uh, and Cushing uh, do more for the proliferation of of clear speech <laughs> in, the, in the outer reaches of the galaxy. Now Lord Vader will provide us with the location of the rebel fortress by the time this station is operational. We will then crush the rebellion with one swift stroke. Peter Cushing died of cancer on the 11th of August, 1994. 
His funeral, eight days later, brought the town of Whitstable to a standstill. Marquis could have settled for playing English types in Hollywood. He did quite well in the very early days with David Niven. He could have carved out a good living there. Do you think, with hindsight, that he fully fulfilled his potential? It's it's hard to say because I think you get you end up again in that that sort of time travel area of of moving people about and thinking well if those opportunities had existed this kind of talent would have flourished in that sort of way um, I think he's left us a a fantastic legacy in an area that is 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 often rather looked down upon it's one of those things that stops him even though he was he was given an OBE and things mm -hmm. like that, that sort of being elevated. To, to a, a top flight of, of film actors because of the kind of things he mostly did. I don't know whether there was anything that suited his particular gifts as well as, as, as the strand of, of horror that he, he mostly did because I think a combination of his sincerity and the slightly manic edge that he could bring to things seemed to suit uh, a slightly heightened form. Um, I, I can't really imagine the British film industry with, would be without him. My thanks to David Miller and Mark Gatiss, and we leave you with a few words from the man himself, speaking not as one of his Hammer Horror self-creations, but as himself, describing his love of the English countryside on BBC Radio in 1972. Goodbye. I used to go for many walks, and when I'm studying a part, I nearly always... Well, I always do take the part out on long walks into the country, along the seashore, to study... Uh, uh, and uh, sometimes that can be uh, made more difficult to study. I think I find the hardest part of my work because that's literally getting the words learnt so you can get rid of the script and get on with the more important part of acting it naturally. Whenever you're out of this country, and obviously your work must take you away quite frequently, do you get terribly homesick? Dreadfully homesick. Particularly, I did never mind it going away since 1942 when I met my dear wife, because she always went with me, and where she went, that was all I wanted. I still missed home, but it was all right being with her. But before that, when I was in America and war had broken out, I was desperately homesick. And the one thing that, uh, uh, the noise that was the most nostalgic for me, and still is to me the most English noise, or the most British noise, are uh, rooks. Coin in a rookery.